Let's begin with a prayer. You can remain seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, how generous you are to each one of us. Graces of peace and mercy, spiritual and material blessings. We ask you to send the Holy Spirit with his gifts of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that through our humble efforts we have a greater knowledge and therefore a greater love of her who is the daughter of the Father, the mother of the Son, the souse of the Holy Spirit, and our own mother Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Joseph, patron of the church, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. It's truly my privilege to be here with you in Auckland on this Saturday in the octave of Easter. How appropriate that in the Saturday of the great octave of the celebration of the resurrection leading to mercy, to divine mercy at such a price, that we would take time to speak about our Blessed Mother. And surely nothing we say will come close to doing her justice because the Father looks at this creature and says, here is my creative best. In fact, after the sacred humanity of Jesus Christ, nothing in all creation comes close to the perfection of grace and virtue to a new creation that is the Father's best. That is the Immaculate Conception. That is our Blessed Mother. And the Fathers of the Church used to say that the best of creation, the blue of the sky, the mountainous regions, everything that's the best of creation is only a reflection of her. Because she is the celestial paradise. She is the perfection that God the Father on one occasion had the opportunity of doing his created best and what he gives us is his virgin daughter, our Blessed Mother. And Jesus looks upon his mother and says, this is the woman from whom I took my flesh. Fulton Sheen used to say, there's only one person that at Calvary could point up to the cross and say, this is my body. And it was first the body of Mary. Have you ever thought about the nine months when Mary was pregnant with Jesus? You know how special it is when you and I receive communion? When we have Jesus, the, the Eucharistic Jesus inside of us? People get very excited about saying, oh, have you had a papal audience with the Holy Father? Was it a private audience? How many times have you had a private audience? The real question is, how many times have you had a private audience with the person that the Pope is vicar of? How many times have you had a private audience with our Eucharistic Jesus? When you had the opportunity of speaking heart to sacred heart about the most intimate things of your life, and that time, right after you've received Holy Communion, is such a special time of intimacy between your heart and his sacred and Eucharistic heart. Well, imagine, after Mary says yes to the angel, she has Jesus, his body, blood, soul, and divinity, in her for nine months, for 24 hours a day. That's like you and me having the Blessed Sacrament, having communion in us, not just for those 10 or 15 or 20 minutes after we receive, but for nine months, 24 hours a day. But in Mary's case, in Mary's case, she starts with a perfection of grace, with an immaculate conception, with a plenitude of grace that the fathers and the doctor of the church have a tough time in finding terms to describe. 
From the moment Mary is conceived in grace, she has more of a participation in the Trinity than all angels and saints put together. And then, at the Annunciation, she's united with Jesus, who is in her, sanctifying her even more. And that's right. That's why the choir of the church sings that it's a wonderment of nature that a creature would give birth to her creator. That's why Jesus sees Mary and says, Mother. And that's why the great saints never separate the sacred heart of Jesus from the immaculate heart of Mary. Theologically, yes. Devotionally in the heart, never. St. John Nudes tells us it's even better to talk about their hearts as one heart, as the one heart of Jesus and Mary, because her heart is so absolutely conformed in every possible way to his heart. And the Holy Spirit looks down upon this woman and he says, spouse. He says, you are the one through whom the word became flesh because I overshadowed you. And just as in the Old Testament, the Shekinah, the cloud of presence, overshadowed the Ark of the Covenant, so too at the Annunciation, the Holy Spirit, who is the cloud of presence, he overshadows Mary, and what happens? Mary becomes the new Ark of the Covenant. Mary becomes the new concrete sign of humanity's yes to divinity. Because in the Ark of the Covenant, you had the manna of the desert. You had the staff of Aaron. And in the Ark of the Covenant, you had the tablets of the Old Testament. But what do you have in Mary from the moment she says yes? You have Eucharist. You have the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. You have Jesus Christ, the perfect priest. You have Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of the law. And that's why wherever Mary goes, the Holy Spirit will follow her, will overshadow her, and miracles will happen. My friends, if anyone had a good excuse not to go to the hill country and serve Elizabeth, it was Mary. I want to go serve Elizabeth, but I'm with child, and it happens to be God. And what if something happens? And I'd love to serve my neighbor, but I have to be focused on Jesus. Mary does the opposite. Because she is the walking tabernacle, she's propelled to fraternal charity. She's propelled to love the person around her. And Elizabeth needs her, who's old in age, so she goes. And what happens when she goes to An Karim to be with Elizabeth? The Holy Spirit comes with her because she is the new Ark of the Covenant. She has Jesus within her. Where the mother goes, the divine spouse will go and miracles will take place. And that's why from the beginning at the visitation, what happens? Two miracles. Before Mary enters the room, Elizabeth is prophesying by the Holy Spirit and John the Baptist is sanctified in the womb. He leaps in the womb. And that's why Mother Teresa was always quick to say that at the visitation, you have an interuterine communion of grace between one unborn child, the God-man, and another unborn child, John the Baptist. The visitation is a profoundly pro-life mystery. And from the Holy Spirit, Mary too must admit and must say, all generations will call me blessed. And my friends, we have a role in that. We have a role in the ultimate fulfillment of Scripture, that all generations will call her blessed. In our brief time today, I want to speak to you about two historical Marian strands of development. Two historical lines of where the truth about Mary is fed and guided by the Holy Spirit. The first strand is what we call Marian public revelation. And we're going to speak briefly about the dogmas of the church regarding Our Lady and the remaining fifth doctrine regarding Our Lady. 
And then we're going to speak about an intersecting strand, another strand, and that is authentic Marian private revelation. As Blessed John the 23rd said in 1959, we must listen to the salutary warnings of the Mother of God, not for the sake of new doctrine, but to guide us in our content and our conduct. That is, we'll never get new truth from Mary in private revelation. We'll never get something that God forgot to give us through Jesus Christ in public revelation but we will get inspirations to be generous, to be more committed, to give our lives in generosity for the gospel life, which is only fully present in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So let's talk about the first strand, the strand of Marian public revelation. In the fifth century, in 431, of the Council of Ephesus, the church proclaimed the first dogma regarding Mary. And some might ask, well, what's a dogma? A dogma is a perfection of a truth. A dogma is the highest level of a church articulation of a truth about Jesus or Mary, about the church in general. So the first Marian dogma was that Mary is the Theotokos, literally the God-bearer that Mary is mother of God the Son made man. And every other prerogative, every other quality of our Blessed Mother comes from the fact that she was immaculate to bring forth the Son into humanity. She is the mediatrix of the mediator. She says yes, and we get the mediator between God and humanity. So every truth about Our Lady is focused on her service to Jesus and her incarnation role in giving God flesh. In the seventh century, in 649, we have the second dogma regarding our Blessed Mother, that she is perpetually virgin. Pope St. Martin I tells us that Mary was virginal before, during, and after the birth of Jesus Christ. That's correct. When Mary says yes to the angel, she says, I know not man. And she says, I know not man, not just in the past, I have not yet known man. But as one author said, when Mary says, I know not man, she's talking about a permanent disposition of her soul. Much like someone could say, uh, would you like a cigarette? And a person responds, no, I, I do not smoke. They're not saying, I, I don't want to smoke now. They're saying, as a permanent disposition, I don't smoke. When Mary says, I know not man, the fathers of the church rightly see she's talking about a permanent disposition that she will be the ultimate disciple of Jesus Christ. She will give him his body, her body, as well as her soul in an act of discipleship. So Mary was virginal before during and after the birth of Christ. Yes, Mary did not have later children. The reference in scripture to the, the brethren of the Lord, Adelphos in Greek means cousins, near relatives. In no sense, in no sense can it be ascribed to Mary that she had other children. And also in the dogma of Mary's virginity, we must remember the middle part that Mary was virginal during the birth of Christ. What does that mean? That means, as Pope Leo the Great and many of the church fathers said, that as light passes through glass without harming the glass, so too Jesus passed through the womb of Mary without any physical violation. That means that it was a miraculous birth to safeguard Mary's physical virginity. Why? Because her physical virginity is an expression in her body of her perfect interior virginity. That is the miraculous birth of Jesus Christ. We then go to the 19th century, and we have in 1854 the dogma of the Immaculate Conception by Blessed Pius IX. My friends, this dogma tells us that God the Father ordained this woman to be the perfect partner with Jesus in the acquisition of grace for the human family. Mary could not be a double agent. 
Mary couldn't be working with Jesus, but at the same time she had some allegiance with Jesus' enemy, the adversary. Genesis 3.15 makes very clear that the woman is set apart. In fact, the scriptural word is enmity from the serpent and his seed. Enmity means absolute, total, radical opposition. In other parts of the Old Testament, it's made reference for, for murder, for the greatest possible distance you could have from someone else. The woman had enmity with the serpent. And their seeds, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, had the same opposition. That's why Pius IX tells us she is without sin. She is full of grace. And that's why years later, St. Maximilian Kolbe would say, when Mary says, I am the Immaculate Conception at places like Lourdes, what she's telling us is, I am by my nature a new creation. I am by who I am full of grace. When the angel came and said, hail full of grace, the Lord is with you. The Greek term for full of grace is kekeratomene, meaning you who have been fully graced as an action in the past. John Paul II tells us that the angel gave a new name to Mary. The angel, Gabriel, did not say, hail Mary, full of grace. He says, hail, full of grace. You are the plenitude of grace. You are the one created by the Father to be the perfect partner with Jesus, to be the new Eve, to restore grace to the human family. You are the greatest creation. And you, as a creature, have the awesome task to accompany the divine God-man to restore grace to the human family. Yes, that's what the fathers of the church meant and understood by the new Eve. The woman with Christ, the new Adam, to restore grace. And if you ever have a doubt of the omnipotence of God, that nothing is impossible with God, remember that God wanted to use the exact same means by which grace was lost. A man, a woman, and a tree he wanted to use those same means because he is truly omnipotent to return grace to us. So he has a new man, Christ the new Adam. He must have a new woman, Mary the new Eve. And he must have a tree, the tree of Calvary, where Satan makes the greatest mistake of his life in participating in our redemption by assisting in the crucifixion of the God-man. A man, a woman, and a tree. And that's why authentic Christian feminism is recognizing that God wanted a woman to participate with the God-man in restoring life as a woman, as a mother, in the height of her femininity. Not in a misguided effort to imitate man, but in living the true beauty and dignity and goodness of what it means to be woman today as mother, and as cooperator with the redemption. And so this is the Immaculate Conception. This is the woman full of grace. This is God's greatest creation. The fourth dogma in 1950 is proclaimed by Pius XII. The fourth dogma completes Mary's earthly life. It is the dogma of her assumption that at the end of her earthly life, Mary is assumed body and soul into heavenly glory. So note, with this fourth dogma, you conclude the truth about Mary during her earthly life. Well, historically, one month after the Assumption, on December 1st, 1950, the International Mariological Society gathered in Rome, and they actually petitioned Pope Pius XII and said, now that you've defined the assumption of Our Lady, let's finish it all. Let's complete Marian dogma. Let's define the one doctrine, which is already a teaching of the church, but the one doctrine that explains Mary's relationship with you and me. The one doctrine which identifies what she does from heaven, and that is that she is the spiritual mother of all peoples that she is the co-redemptrix and the mediatrix of all graces, that she is really the greatest advocate for humanity, bringing our petitions to the throne of God. 
And that was a strong order to ask a Holy Father to do another definition a month after he defined the assumption. But the logic is here. If we want to complete the fullness of truth regarding Our Lady, we must include her relationship to us as a spiritual mother. Now, some 50 years earlier, a great Belgian cardinal, Cardinal Mercier, known for his great Marian love and his great ecumenical activity, he began a process of petitioning the Holy Father at the time to make a solemn papal def uh, definition of this very truth, that Mary is your mother and my mother, that Jesus from the cross gave us as his final gift before it was finished, before consummatum est. He gave us the gift of his mother that we would have her in the midst of our calvaries, in the midst of our sufferings, in the midst of our efforts to be true to our Lord Jesus. And he gave us his mother. And my friends, it was not an invitation. It was the establishing of a divine fact. He said, ecce mater tua, behold your mother. He did not say, would you like my mother as your mother? He said, behold your mother. And this is the gift which we must live. This is the gift we must accept. And every Bible-believing Christian is called to accept this biblical gift from the crucified Jesus to each one of us individually, to behold his mother as our mother. Well, Cardinal Mercier, in the 1915s, began to petition the Holy Father. He gathered the petitions of several hundred bishops and presented to the Holy Father, saying, now is the time. Now is the time to crown Our Lady with this fifth dogma, to solemnly define that she is our spiritual mother. But in fact, it were to take more time. In the 1920s, Cardinal Mercier was joined by Saint Maximilian Kolbe in this international petition drive asking the Holy Father to give Our Blessed Mother the crown on earth which she already bears in heaven, that she is our spiritual mother under the, these three dimensions. And as the 20th century progressed, you have many authors saying it's not a question of if Mary will be defined as our spiritual mother, it's only a question of when. And in fact, in the last 15 years, there have been some 7 million petitions and over 550 cardinals and bishops that have petitioned the Holy Father to give the mother the crown now to solemnly define this truth now. And we'll return to that issue when we talk about what is the present status of this question. But that's the development of public revelation. Four dogmas regarding Our Lady and a fifth doctrine, which is already the official teachings of the Catholic Church, that Mary is our spiritual mother under three aspects. She is the co-redemptrix, as John Paul II called her on six different occasions. She is the mediatrix of each and every grace we receive from Jesus, from Calvary. And she is the advocate for the people of God, that no one brings our needs to the throne of Christ the King like the mother of Jesus does. Well, now let's examine another strand of Marian development, and that's the strand of authentic Marian private revelation. John the 23rd, Blessed John the 23rd in 1985 said, it's the responsibility of Roman pontiffs to bring to the attention those supernatural light which is pleases God to send souls to lead us in our conduct. That's a papal way of saying, number one, Marian apparitions happen. Number two, we ought to thank God when they happen. Because they do not replace public revelation, but they inspire they encourage, they call us to a new generosity. And if each of you would, would recall your last Marian pilgrimage to a Marian apparition site, if you would recall the grace, the encouragement, the zeal you had there, and at least the first weeks upon returning, you would know that these are really gifts from God. So technically, we don't need Marian private revelation. Practically, we thank God and he sends his mother with these extraordinary graces to help us to live the gospel life. Well, let's briefly ex uh, examine that strand. Uh, what's the strand of authentic Marian private revelation, which we now call the Age of Mary? 
Well, let's start in 1830. 1830 is technically the date which begins this age of Mary. We have the apparitions of our Blessed Mother at Rudabach, commonly called Our Lady of Grace or the Miraculous Medal. And as you know, St. Catherine Labore received visions of our Blessed Mother, after which a medal was coined. And on November 27th, there were two images in this vision. Our Lady said, strike a medal after these images. Image number one was our Blessed Mother with her hounds outstretched, grace is flowing from her hands and from her, the rings on her fingers, and she is crushing Satan's head with her foot. And around the image are the words, O Mary, conceive without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. Now what's symbolically contained on that little one-inch medal? Most every dogma and doctrine regarding Our Lady that the Church teaches. For example, she's crushing the head of Satan. That is her role as co-redemptrix. And be very clear, co-redemptrix does not mean Mary is equal to Jesus. That would be direct heresy. You would not have John Paul II and Padre Pio and Saint Maria Escrives and Sister Lucia of Fatima and Mother Teresa all defending a title that was heretical. Co-redemptrix, as the popes and saints and mystics use the term, talk about Mary's unique cooperation with Jesus in the work of redemption. And so Mary is crushing the head of Satan as the co-redemptrix. Secondly, Mary's hands are outstretched. She is the mediatrix of all graces. And thirdly, in the prayer, it says, O Mary, conceive without sin, the Immaculate Conception, pray for us who have recourse to thee. That is her role as advocate. So already these three titles of co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate are part, an essential foundational part of the age of Mary. You turn the image around in the vision, the back of the miraculous medal, what do you have? You have an M attached to the cross. Again, the co-redemptrix. And that has to be emphasized because, my friends, John Paul II says each one of us must become co-redeemers in Christ. That's right, we are called to make up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Colossians 1.24. We are called to offering the sufferings, whatever's weighing you down right now, the difficulties of your family life, your marriage, your children, your occupation, economic crisis, disease, sickness, whatever it be, you can make that supernaturally valuable by uniting it with the sufferings of Jesus. Mothers used to tell their children, after they skinned their knees or fell, offer it up, honey. Offer it up, dear. And usually didn't have to accompany that with a deep theological explanation. The kid got it. I'm supposed to patiently endure this somehow. Now we're called to be co-redeemers. That we can actually have a role in the release of grace to save someone else's eternal soul if we suffer well. But we need a model of human suffering. And that's Mary, co-redemptrix. So on the back of the medal, we have an M attached to the cross. We also have her queenship identified by the 12 stars. And we have two hearts united. And that's the heart of this entire age of Mary, the sacred heart of Jesus and the immaculate heart of Mary. The Eucharistic heart of Jesus pierced for us and the sorrowful heart of Mary that suffered in every way his heart suffered because she is his mother. And that's the prophecy of Simeon. A sword shall pierce through your own heart too. We go to 1858 and we go to Our Lady of Lourdes. Our Lady of Lourdes is an apparition of the Immaculate Conception as she identifies herself there. But Lourdes is a deep message of co-redemption. Meaning once again, we are called to offer prayer and reparation for two intentions. Number one, to atone to God for the sins of humanity, and starting with our own sins. Number two, for the conversion of sinners. You see, my friends, in the mystical body, we have a great dignity, we have a great possibility. We can actually help the redemption of someone else. St. Thomas Aquinas says the angels envy each one of us because the angels cannot suffer in their bodies and unite it with Jesus to get someone else into heaven but you and I can, in virtue of being members of the mystical body. 
So what does our Blessed Mother say to Bernadette at Lourdes? What's the message? Praying the rosary by example, doing penance, 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 as she repeats, to atone to God in this order of reparation. So again, it's a call to be co-redeemers. I give you this domestic example. Let's say that you have a mother and father who are very good to their five children. And let's say sadly and unjustly, four of the five children reject their mother and father and blaspheme their love and break the commandment which calls for the proper honoring of mother and father. And they're very sad and they're heartbroken. But let's say the fifth child, the smallest child, comes up and says, Mommy and Daddy, don't listen to them. It's not true. You're a good mother and a good father, and I love you with all my heart. What a bomb that is to the injustice of the other four children. Well, my friends, we are supposed to be that little child. We're supposed to be the fifth child that says to the hearts of Jesus and Mary, what others say about you, those who deny God, those who reject the teachings of the church, those who dissent from the moral teachings, those who reject the love of the Blessed Mother, it's unjust, it's untrue. And I, with my little heart, say, I love you. And I want to bomb your hearts with my little heart. That, my friends, is the call of reparation. And each one of us have the call to offer reparation for the sins of humanity in a special way to the hearts of Jesus and Mary. So Lourdes is a call of prayer, penance, and reparation. And in 1917, the call of reparation and consecration continues powerfully with the message of Fatima. In many ways, the Fatima message represents the foundational message of the 20th century of our Blessed Mother. And what does she call for at Fatima? She calls for consecration to her Immaculate Heart. She calls for daily rosary, for peace in the world. She makes reference of the five first Saturdays of reparation, where every first Saturday we are called to offer communion, confession, five decades of the rosary, and 15 minutes of meditation, all with the intention of offering reparation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Why? Because the child Jesus and our Blessed Mother both identify as Mary holds her heart out and shows it to Sister Lucia Fatima, look at my heart which is wounded at every moment by the ingratitude of humanity. You at least try to make reparation to this heart. And that's why it's so important that the five first Saturdays are done in reparation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And to that, the Mediatrix of all graces gives the promise of salvation. Grace is necessary for salvation for five first Saturdays. But there's also a very strong message of co-redemption in the Fatima message. For those of you who've had the opportunity of reading Sister Lucia's last great work, Calls from the Message of Fatima, completed in 1997, on seven different occasions in her last work, Sister Lucia of Fatima calls Our Lady the co-redemptrix and gives a profound theological explanation of why she's the co-redemptrix, of why from the moment she said yes to the archangel, she gave something to Jesus that, no, that none of the rest of us could give. She gave to Jesus the instrument of redemption and she suffered with Jesus at Calvary. I also must make reference of, of the, the, the profundity of, of Blessed Mother Teresa, who in my opinion was the greatest single advocate for this Fifth Marian dogma. In 1994, on the feast of St. Maximin Kolbe, I had the undeserved privilege of being with Mother, and she asked for six different talks on this Fifth Marian dogma in, in the couple days I was in Calcutta. But in the first two minutes, Mother said in, in, in the Mother House in Calcutta, she said, of course Mary is the co-redemptrix. She gave to Jesus his body, and his body is what saves us. I said, Mother, that's the difference between sanctity and theologians. You say in 45 seconds what it takes us books to write. <laughs> of course she's the co-redemption. Who would dare say they cooperated with Jesus in redemption more than Mary? This is not a difficult doctrine, my friends. This is a obvious biblical truth. So we have this truth about the Blessed Mother, and it's also present in Fatima. In Fatima, the Blessed Mother, 
on July 13, 1917, says, Pray the Rosary every day to obtain peace in the world because only she can save you. Only she can save you? What about the Trinity? What about our Lord Jesus? Well, this task has been given by them to her. Sister Lucia Fatima told us that the Sacred Heart of Jesus wants the Immaculate Heart of Mary seen alongside his heart. And that's why on October 13, 1917, during the Solar Miracle, Mary appeared at Fatima as the co-redemptrix, as Our Lady of Sorrows. And I also want to say, on that October 13th day, who else appears? St. Joseph appears. My friends, we will not have a triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary without the direct intercession of St. Joseph. He's the patron of the Universal Church. He appeared at Fatima on that day to remind us that as the patron of the Universal Church, we must return to an ardent love and devotion to St. Joseph. St. Augustine said, what Joseph was to Jesus, Joseph is to you and me. He's a spiritual foster father. He's the greatest saint after Mary. It wasn't like the Blessed Mother said to Joseph, I've got to go down and appear at Fatima. Are you doing anything in heaven? Would you like to join me? <laughs> it was a revelation of what we need to fulfill the message of Fatima, which is the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So she is the co-redemptrix, and he is the patron of the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. 28 years after Fatima, as Ambassador Howard D. from the Philippines, the former Vatican ambassador, pointed out. 28 years, in 1945, you have another apparition which was approved by the local bishop as authentic on May 31, 2002. Those are the apparitions of Our Lady of All Nations at Amsterdam. On May 31, 2002, the local bishop gave the highest level of approval, constat de supernaturalitate, that these messages consist of a supernatural origin. What was the message of the Lady of All Nations in Amsterdam? At the backbone of the message was a call from Our Lady herself for the solemn papal definition of Mary as co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate. She said specifically that until this dogma is proclaimed, we will not have peace in the world. And we'll talk about why. Why would you need a dogma? to bring forth the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. Because we remember the message of Fatima. And Our Lady said specifically, after predicting the Holy Father suffering much, after giving a vision of hell, after predicting a conditional Second World War, after saying there would be a various annihilation of nations, she also said on July 13, 1917, quote, in the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph and a period of peace will be granted to the world. Well, my friends, read the newspapers. We are not in a period of peace. We are not there yet. Not globally, not internally, and also, we know we're not in a period of peace because of what's happening through the tragedy in the womb. Do you know that the safest geography in the world used to be the womb of a mother? Now, my friends, it is the most dangerous geography. The greatest danger you have is getting past the time of the womb. That's why we've lost 55 million people. That's why we've lost a generation, at least, to abortion. No, we are not in an era of peace when you have this widespread abortion attacking the image of God the Father in the womb of women. And so the Amsterdam message calls for the proclamation of the dogma that through this proclamation, our Lady will be freed to fully exercise her role as co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate right now for the Church and for the world today. And our Blessed Mother gave a special prayer on the anniversary of Lourdes on February 11, 1951, a prayer of the Lady of All Nations, which she said, pray this prayer in preparation for this final Marian dogma. And it's a beautiful prayer to the Holy Spirit, asking Jesus to send the Holy Spirit into each heart. Uh, you can receive the prayer, you can go on Google and put in Lady of All Nations, you can go to fifthmariandogma.com, you can go to ladyofallnations.com, it's, it's throughout the internet. Uh, the prayer goes as follows, and by the way, the prayer has received over 60 imprimaturs from 60 individual bishops throughout the world. The prayer goes as follows, Lord Jesus Christ, 
Son of the Father, send now your Spirit over the earth. Let the Holy Spirit live in the hearts of all nations that they may be preserved from degeneration, disaster, and war. May the Lady of all nations, the Blessed Virgin Mary, be our advocate. So it's a prayer that Our Lady gave specifically to prepare the church and the world for the proclamation of this dogma. And what is it asking for? It's asking Jesus to send the Holy Spirit in a type of a new Pentecost to prevent degeneration, disaster, and war. So if we look at the papers, if we do a global examination of conscience, what do we see now in unprecedented levels? We see moral degeneration, family breakdown, moral degeneration, abortion, efforts for cloning, the ultimate offense to God the Father, saying we don't need you to begin life and we don't need you to end life. We can start our life and we can end our life on our own. We see natural disaster. International Red Cross says the numbers of natural disaster in the last 10 to 15 years have far exceeded all other periods. Natural disaster. And we have war and we have terrorism in unprecedented degrees. And the brink and rumor of more to come. We need the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes in a new Pentecost the way he came the first time, through Mary, his divine spouse. Mary being the human spouse, the Spirit becoming divine spouse. And that's the prayer of John the 23rd at the Second Vatican Council. He asked for a new descent of the Holy Spirit. That was the prayer of Pope Benedict XVI when he was in the United States, calling the church in America to, to pray for a new descent of the Holy Spirit. That was also his prayer in World Youth Day in Sydney. A call for a new Pentecost, a new release of the Holy Spirit through the Immaculate Heart of Mary, his spouse. And that's the message of Amsterdam. That when the Lady is proclaimed as co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate, the Holy Spirit will be able to enter the church and the world like never before, since the first Pentecost. 28 years from Amsterdam, 1945, we go to Akita, Japan, 1973, another approved, church-approved apparition in 1973 called the Fatima of the East. In Akita, we have a series of apparitions and weepings, lacrimations as they're technically called, and it was a statue of the Lady of All Nations from Amsterdam, the image coming from Amsterdam, that wept 101 times in Akita, Japan, in a Japanese convent to Sister uh, Agnes Sasagawa, one of the religious sisters there, who was deaf when these apparitions began. And what was Our Lady's message? Well, the bishop who approved Akita, Bishop John Ito, said, Akita is a continuation of Amsterdam. And that's clear because the image is the image of Our Lady of All Nations, which is the image of Our Blessed Mother uh, in front of the cross with her arms outstretched. And in this 101 times of lacrimations, Our Lady said, and Lady reveals, that she is in pain. She is in mystical sorrow for the sufferings of humanity. This should not be a surprise to us, my friends. Imagine if you were the mother of humanity right now. Imagine if you saw and experienced every abortion. You saw every act of human trafficking. You saw every family breakdown. You saw every infidelity. You saw every time a priest or religious was not true to their vows. You would be crying too. The mother sees it all. And on September 15th of 1981, the angel of the visionary, the guardian angel, gave her a vision and explanation that the 101 times of the weeping in Akita symbolizes Our Lady's role as co-redemptrix. The first one represents Eve, the first Eve, the zero represents God's eternity, and the second one represents Our Lady's role as the new Eve. And as her spiritual director said, this is the message of Mary Corridentrix. She still is suffering for humanity today in a mystical way because of the sins of humanity. Akita also reports a strong message of a conditional punishment for humanity if we do not convert. And the image was a fire falling from the sky. Some have associated the fire falling from the sky reference in Akita in the 1970s to the sorrow miracle at Fatima in 1917. That was also an image of fire falling from the sky and a call for us to pray. 
Cardinal Ratzinger said in his commentary on the third secret of Fatima that we have the capacity ourselves of bringing apart, bringing upon us a great nuclear disaster. That the message of Fatima is more relevant to us today than ever before. And so Akita continues this call for Our Lady Co-Redemptrix and for the acknowledgement of this role of Mary as Co-Redemptrix. Now I've understood that New Zealand is also a land rich in its love of Our Lady of Medjugorje. Is that correct? Sir? I wanted to say a quick reference about Our Lady of Medjugorje, which actually begins in 1981 when Akita ends. Let me start by mentioning the position of the church regarding Medjugorje. If you hear that Medjugorje is condemned, if you hear that you cannot go to Medjugorje uh, because the local bishop is opposed, uh, both those things sadly are inaccurate. The official position of the church regarding Medjugorje, as clarified by Archbishop Bertone, who was the secretary under Cardinal Ratzinger in 1998 from the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, he established that the 1991 Zadar Statement, which was the statement of the Yugoslavian Episcopal Conference in 1991, established that while the church does not yet approve Medjugorje, it does not condemn Medjugorje, and pilgrims may faithfully go to Medjugorje with an open heart. So pilgrimages to Medjugorje are absolutely allowed by the church, and we always wait for the final definitive judgment of the church, but it is the congregation's own statement that people can go to Medjugorje, so we always rest with the church. What is Medjugorje right now? Medjugorje is Mary Corredemptrix, Mediatrix, and Advocate in action. In action. She suffers for us, as she said in her messages. When we sin, she suffers. She is the Mediatrix between Jesus and humanity. She says that in her message as well. She is the ultimate advocate, intercessor on our behalf. That's why she's pleading for prayers, for fastings, for rosaries, for peace, a spiritual peace of heart, which will become a peace globally if we cooperate. So authentic Marian private revelation only confirms what we see in the line of development leading for this fifth Marian dogma. So I want to say one other brief word about these three roles of co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate. Number one, they are already, once again, the official teachings of the church's magisterium. Our Lady as co-redemptrix, and by the way, the prefix co in Latin comes from the word cum, it means with, not equal. Mary is with Jesus in the work of redemption. She is never equal. Nothing would pierce her immaculate heart more than for anyone to think she was equal to her son. Her son is divine, she is not. But she cooperates like no one else in this redemption. Scripture attests to this truth. Luke 1.38, Mary says yes to the angel, and she brings to us the Redeemer of the world. That's already a cooperation none of us could boast. Luke 2.35, the prophecy of Simeon. Simeon basically says, your son will be a sign of contradiction for the world and your heart too will be pierced. Someone called me on, on a radio program recently and said, I don't know why people have such a problem with Mary Corredemptrix. My daughter had an operation two months ago. It was a life-threatening operation. It would have been easier for me to be operated on than to be in the waiting room. Easier. And parents will attest to this. We'd rather suffer ourselves then know and see the sufferings of a loved one. That's Mary Corredemptrix. Where's the mystery? And it's scripturally verified that Mary's unique suffering, in the words of Simeon, would add to the secret thoughts of many being laid bare. That's the work of redemption. In John 19, 26, John Paul II says that Mary is spiritually crucified with her crucified son as the Corredemptrix. And her role as Corredemptrix does not cease with the glorification of her son. So I would ask you, are you afraid of the title Mary Corredemptrix? Does the title frighten you? Well, remember, John Paul II used it six times. Mother Teresa used it. Saint Jose Maria Escriva used it. Padre Pio used it. Saint Elizabeth, Saint uh, Edith Stein used it. Mother Cabrini used it. And again, Sister Lucia of Fatima used it. These are people I think I can say we can trust. 
These are saints and popes and mystics. And it's relaying a truth that it's at the heart of our church. By the way, she's been called the co-redemptrix since the 14th century. And she's had the role of co-redemptrix since scripture and the understanding of Our Lady as the New Eve. Secondly, she's the mediatrix of all grace. What does this mean? This means every single grace we receive from Jesus Christ comes to us through the mediation of our Blessed Mother. One mother put it this way. She said, I'm a breastfeeding mother. And she said, I've realized that we need the humility of going to Mary the way my child comes to my breast. That we must breastfeed, we must suckle the milk of sanctifying grace from Our Lady. And we have to keep humble as children, knowing we need that role. Again, scripture attests that she's the mediatrix of all grace. She says yes to the angel, and what happens? She mediates to us the mediator of the world. She is also mediatrix of all graces at Cana. And the first reading of Cana can be confusing at times. Mary brings the intention to Jesus, and we know scripture says, Woman, what is this to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. I mentioned to my students at Franciscan University, University of Steubenville, if your mother during your high school years asked you to do something, let's say, dear, it's time to make your bed and straighten up your room, and as your mother asked that request, you responded to her quoting scripture, woman, what is this to you and to me? My time has not yet come. <laughs> you might experience a type of domestic chastisement. But the words woman connects Mary with the woman of Genesis, the woman of Revelation, who battles the ancient foe, the woman of Galatians, the woman of Cana, and the woman of Calvary. She's the woman. And she does mediate the first public miracle of Jesus Christ. Because the son does not deny the mother anything. Because the mother's will is perfectly conformed to the son. She is the mediatrix of all graces. And thirdly, she is the advocate. Advocari in Latin means to speak on behalf of another. And in many languages, the word advocate is also the term for lawyer. Uh, I was speaking in Bolivia a few years back at an international Latin American Marian Congress, and I spoke about Our Lady as advocate, and a couple of the representatives came up and said, Sir, I'm sorry, uh, in Spanish, the word abogada means lawyer. Are you calling the Blessed Mother a lawyer? And I said, well, uh, in a sense, she is a lawyer, but it's a different court. It's the court of Christ the King, and we are her clients. When I mentioned that explanation to a lawyer in Texas, uh, after my presentation, he came up and said, son, here's $1,000 for your movement. I've been a lawyer for 40 years and never compared to the Blessed Mother. <laughs> That's how Catholic Texans show their devotion. Uh, at any rate, of course, she's our principal advocate. And this comes out of the Old Testament. She's the Queen Mother. She's the Queen Mother in the Kingdom of God. And I know in my own family life with, with eight children, if my children come up and ask Dad for something, I say, oh, honey, I don't know if this is the right time. I don't know if we have time. But if it comes from my wife, who is the Queen Mother, the invitation takes on a whole different nature. <laughs> I need a very good reason to say no. St. Louis de Montfort says, it's the peasant who wants to give his fruit to the king. And he goes and he takes his best apples, but they're still just apples. But if the queen takes them and the queen puts them on her golden platter and the queen adorns those apples and the queen presents the apples to the king in her name, oh, they take on a luster, a beauty. That's what the mother does for us, for our petitions. So she is the co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate. And why do we need a dogma? Why would I encourage you to join the 7 million people who have sent their petitions, that's over 168 countries, who have sent their petitions to the Holy Father, and why even more than sending a petition do I encourage you to pray for the dogma daily? Because, my friends, her titles are her functions. That means co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate are not just honorary titles. Those are her functions given by God for humanity. But God the Father gives us a very important ground rule, and that is, you cannot force grace. People have to freely accept it. And so when we pray for this solemn definition, when we do our part to bring forward scripture that all generations will call her blessed, when we pray daily for the fifth Marian dogma in our masses, in our rosaries, 
when we pray the prayer that Our Lady specifically gave, the prayer of the Lady of All Nations, for the Fifth Marian Dogma, we are adding to releasing her. We're acknowledging her role in freedom so she can fully exercise those functions for humanity today. So yeah, it's a matter of freedom. As one author said, God the Father waited for a yes of a 15-year-old girl to bring us the Savior. Now we wait, and she waits for the yes of the Holy Father to be fully released so she can fully exercise her powers of intercession for the world today. So I encourage you in every Mass, in every Rosary, adding the words, pray for the dogma, pray for the Fifth Marian dogma. If you can get the Prayer of the Lady of All Nations, that's powerful because it was given by Our Lady herself. But let's do our part to release her because as she says, no dogma, no triumph of the Immaculate Heart. With the proclamation of the dogma, she is fully free to fully exercise her functions for humanity. I'm going to close with a quote from Mother Teresa of Calcutta, again written on August 14, 1993, on the Feast of St. Maximilian Kolbe. This is how Mother put it, and I quote, Mary is our co-redemptrix with Jesus. She gave Jesus his body and suffered with him at the foot of the cross. Mary is the mediatrix of all grace. She gave Jesus to us, and as our mother, she obtains for us all his graces. Mary is our advocate who prays to Jesus for us. It is only through the heart of Mary that we come to the Eucharistic heart of Jesus. The papal definition of Mary as co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate will bring great graces to the church. All for Jesus through Mary. God bless you. M. Teresa, M.C. If you want to join your petition to Mother Teresa's and over seven million, you can write to the Holy Father. It's an easy address, Pope Benedict XVI, 00120 Vatican City, Europe. Yeah, he's our Holy Father and he wants to hear from us as well. We're his children. If you have internet, you can go to the fifthmariandogma.com and do an online petition. Most of all, pray. Pray that our Holy Father can release our Blessed Mother because we need peace today. We need a prevention from degeneration, disaster, war today. We need our mother today. Thank you and God bless you.